Now one question a lot of students have been asking is, in all these equations to calculate the mass of the white dwarf or the unseen companion, we've got some star that's going in circles, and we need to know the mass of that star, the red dwarf, whatever it might be, to work out the mass of this mysterious thing orbiting it. And that's just been your m1 in our equations. But a lot of people have been asking, where did that come from? In all the homework in this course, we've just been telling you mass of the star is this or that. But in the real world, we don't know that. Well, how do you work it out? So I thought we'd investigate that a bit. So Brian, let's say you see a star and it's doing loop-the-loops or something weird is going on, so you know there's something mysterious like a white dwarf or a black hole or a neutron star near it. We can't work out the mass of that mysterious thing unless we know the mass of the star that's going around it, and we can't work out anything unless we know how far away it is. So how, if you see a star out there, how would you work out how far away it is and how massive it is? So stars tell us uh, essentially how massive they are by how hot they are and how uh, puffy they are, what the radius is. So easy to measure the temperature of a star. Uh, you just look at essentially its color. And the bluer it is, the hotter it is. And we can measure, it turns out, the temperature to probably within 100 degrees pretty easily Kelvin. And that gives us essentially through the black body equation uh, how much energy it puts out if we know its area. Mm -hmm. Now the area is hard, er, but there is one indication we can do. And that is uh, we can measure the gravity of the star because the gravity of the star uh, affects the way that, for example, hydrogen lines are formed. So talking about the surface gravity, how strong gravity right. is, if you were standing on the surface of the star, of course, you wouldn't stand on the surface of the star if you right. could possibly avoid it. But we, we know here on Earth we're at 9.8 <coughs> meters per second squared, and we can essentially measure that same thing okay. uh, on these stars because hydrogen, it turns out, the way a hydrogen spectral line looks depends on how much gravity there is in that. So once you've estimated the gravity, well, what's that surface gravity equal to? It's a, it's a combination of mass and distance, the radius of mm. the star. So you say, well, okay, you don't know that. Except for we sort of do. And that's because stars, when they evolve, their nuclear reactors revolve, uh, evolve, they sit in very specific places between temperature and the total energy they're putting out. And we can put all these things together and actually say, that star is a red giant mm -hmm. that is about two times the mass of our sun that has this temperature and this surface gravity. And we can sort of pick it out in that thing with that amount of information. Okay. So what we can measure is the temperature and the surface gravity. Um, but the surface gravity doesn't tell us either the mass or the radius, but a combination of the two. So you yep. need some other clue. And that other clue comes from either our models of stars. So right. we know, for example, that the surface gravity is enough to tell us whether it's, say, a red giant or a red dwarf. And we know that all red dwarfs are more or less the same, and all red giants are kind of the same. Or it could also be something we measure empirically, because often we will find um, stars that are much nearer, so we actually can measure the distance to it um, by something like parallax. We look, yeah. as the Earth goes around the sun, we see how the angle changes and work out how far away it is. And if it's in a binary companion, uh, we can use the orbital parameter with a normal star, so maybe two, like Alpha Centauri, two yellow dwarf stars orbiting each other, we can use that to try and measure the mass of the two things. So we can use that to kind of calibrate our theoretical models. That's right. So we have these models, and then there is this whole scaffolding of essentially being able to measure distances through parallax, measuring different things such as the mass, and building the whole thing up and making self-consistent. So, you know, a hundred years of astrophysics really is calibrating those models and they're pretty good now and once you have essentially what we call that Hertzsprung russell diagram which really tells you these things you literally can use that to say it's one of those stars and so it's very yeah. useful so we get a detailed spectrum look at the exact shape of the lines and that gives and particularly the ratios of different spectral lines that tells us surface gravity we know the color for, um, therefore we can measure the temperature that tells us it's going to be say a 6,000 degree star either a a uh, dwarf star or a giant star or possibly a white dwarf or a supergiant. Surface gravity tells us which of these things we are and once we know which of these it are, we can compare it with nearer ones or with theoretical models and know how massive these things are or how luminous they are or what their radius is. Absolutely. So that's essentially the way we do it. Occasionally we get lucky and there's a way to measure the distance to the system itself, in which case, of course, we then 
can literally le read off. We know how bright it is. We know how far away it is. And there has to be some sort of geometric uh, conspiracy, which gives us that little insight in this case, often related to parallax. So, but most of the time we don't have that. So this is a way yeah. we can do it for most stars. I know for some sources, if they're only seen at radio wavelengths, you can't see the companion stops. Much harder to get the distances. So, for example, for pulsars, which yes. we'll talk about later in this course, in this case you can use a trick called rotation measure. Often the radio waves coming from these things are polarized, so the radio waves here will be going up and down in this direction. But as they travel through interstellar space, the radio waves go past electrons, and they cause the electrons to jiggle. And that rotates the polarization, but it rotates it differently depending on whether it's a low frequency or a high frequency wave. So the high frequency waves are rotated less, the low frequency ones are rotated more. So what you find is that as you change your frequency, you can see that the angle of polarization shifts. And that tells you basically how many electrons are on the line of sight from Earth to right. this thing. Then you have to guess what the electron density of interstellar space is, which is rather hard and probably not constant. Uh, but that also gives you a way of measuring distances if you don't see any optical light at all. That's right. So what astronomers have done is they've really mapped out, essentially, the number of electrons in the Milky Way through a bunch of another 100 years of astrophysics. And so any direction we know sort of where distance is versus how much of this, uh, how many electrons there are and how much the, uh, the radio uh, has rotated in its polarization. Mm -hmm. And that gives us probably a, a measurement which is good to within a factor of two usually, uh, sometimes quite a bit better. But uh, it's a good rough measure. And there are other tricks you can play, like, for example, if something's in front of a giant molecular cloud, then you know if it was behind, you wouldn't see it. Yep. Um, if you see absorption lines from something, say, from a, a, a nebula, uh, then you know it must be behind it. So you can get relative distances sometimes, this sort of way. It can be quite hard, though. Yeah, but uh, within a factor of two, and most of astronomy is factors of two, uh, then we really can sort things mm -hmm. out here. So bottom line is, it is possible to measure the masses of these stars. How you do so is complicated. As Brian said repeatedly, it's 100 years of astrophysics. Uh, it's not always very reliable. Sometimes it can be very reliable. It's a bit beyond the scope of this course. So for the problems in this course, we'll just tell you the masses of the companion star. Yes.